much. Um, first off, I want to thank everybody that's shown up tonight to show concern for our kids. Not just my kids, but there are many other kids and many other parents that have made me more emotional <coughs> over all this. I am the mother of three girls, two of which attend Emerson Elementary. I work in healthcare and I'm still trying to further my education. Politics is not my thing. I've never been involved in anything um, besides voting. Uh, I always have tried to stand back and I think this is the first thing that I've ever protested for. It's the first thing that I've ever actually voted for. Um, if there are two things I hate most, it's public speaking and dental work. I would say that I understand budget cuts. I deal with them all the time in our home. With both my husband and I being students, things get very tight. I understand the district is not just my children. I understand the greater good. But there are many things that I do not understand. When I attended the meetings in January, and I'm not going to use any direct quotes because I'm not good at that, I remember Mr. Allison talking about how if we needed, if if we wanted more funding, we needed to talk to our state legislature. Governor Brownback had something up, and it seems to not have very much support anymore. So my question is, why push on with something when we have no idea if this is going to pass? And it seems to me, from reading all the articles, that it probably won't. He's losing steam. People, This is a very controversial subject, and a lot of people don't feel like they can back that. Sit up until the, oh, I'm sorry. The USC 259 is putting into place a proposal based on the funding that we are expecting for Brownback's plan. So my question is, why are we jumping the gun if we have no idea what's going to happen? Why don't we wait and find out what's going to really happen before you put something in place? This is not all. Because you're voting tonight on a point <coughs> when all the details are not worked out. Us parents, we've asked many questions, mainly, my concern is transportation. You guys have, I guess, voted to grandfather our children into Lewis. I was once a Lewis parent, and our problem was transportation. I was paying an enormous amount in gas to get my daughter to the other side of school, or the other side of town for school, and I paid an enormous amount in latchkey. Now I have two children, and soon three, that will be going to Lewis, possibly. So how, if you guys don't know if you're going to bust my children there, how am I ever going to do Our next speaker is Jim Slayton. Hi, in the 2012-2013 school year. The first gut punch is delivered. Why, we ask. To which we are told, it's your size, nothing more. We know there's nothing wrong with your building, staff, or performance. It's strictly economics. It costs the same to operate a school of 200 as a school of 400. Then we are informed that the board is holding community meetings to address our questions and give us a chance to provide feedback. We turn out by the hundreds to provide our solutions and share our concerns. Next, we show up for the focus group meeting, where we were told our input would be taken into consideration. We wait, eager to hear the answers to our questions, debate over our solutions. It doesn't happen. Instead, the 150-page document is summarily dismissed as what we expected from upset parents. Then, almost simultaneously, come the second and third gut punches. Anything else, and can we live with it? 
We came expecting to hear debate, discussion, answers to our questions like, other schools are small, without FEMA shelters, aren't ADA compliant, have no room to expand, so why us and not them? We just wanted answers. Hurt but hopeful, we come to the conclusion that the discussion will happen at the committee of the whole meeting. We continue our letter writing, sign making, research, group discussions. We meet individually with board members where we are given sympathy, respect, understanding, and suggestions, and where we are surprised by defensiveness, hurtness, and the promise and praise of a bright, shiny new school, a huge new school. We attend the Committee of the Whole, eager for answers, discussion, and debate, fearful of solid, valid reasons that our school must close. Instead, we witness one lone voice of question get a stern procedural slap down. But at last, a ray of hope. I knew it. The board is listening. They're going to ask our questions. They hear us. They're going to give us answers. It's going to happen at the next meeting. The next meeting comes. Another gut punch. By this time, we are exhausted. We hear daily and repeatedly, they made up their minds months ago. Nothing you can say will change their mind. They're not listening to you. And we say over and over again, yes, they will. They say, no, you don't care what, they don't care what you say or what you prove. They're going to close the schools and that's all that's going to happen. And I say, it might be so, and they may even have valid reasons, but why weren't we informed in this process? I hope you now understand. I'm sure this may have been a long, thought out, well-discussed 18-month process for you, but for us, it has been a torturously long two-month waiting game filled with confusion, gut punches, lies, false hope, and finally, Thank anger and outrage. Thank you. Our next speaker is Megan and 
and hoping for the children's sake that you will reconsider this decision. side of this issue, the idea of fiscal responsibility. I'm not totally familiar with the Lincoln and Mueller or Lothi's magnet neighborhoods. Uh, some of the movement there seems to be fairly close addresses. I am deeply uh, aware of Indian Hills and Orchard Park neighborhoods. I've lived there for 15 years before I moved to my current ad address. My daughter and her family live there now. Um, I know from visiting schools and taking part in uh, participation uh, and activities, that there is little to no excess capacity in any building in that whole area of town. The need for classrooms is not an emotional issue, it's a fiscal issue. Replacement costs for classrooms that close um, are considerably greater than the cost of maintaining classrooms that are open, especially when we have well-maintained schools that we spent millions of dollars on in the last decade. Okay, now let's look at an enormous game changer that is on our doorstep. I don't know how many of you have heard the words Mississippi and limestone, but it has arrived. There is an emerging oil boom in South Central Kansas. <coughs> it's not far away, it's not iffy, it is today. Look at what's already happened in Alfalfa County, Oklahoma, and Harper and Barber County, Kansas. There are 52,000 acres of land up for lease auction this week in Sedgwick County. Exploratory rigs are already drilling and they are finding oil. In the next 12 to 18 months, we'll know how big this is going to be. But if it is even 5% of the projection, it would create hundreds of new students in the Wichita School District, and I am not exaggerating. Some people are saying 100,000 workers in South Central Kansas. Um, I beg you to do the same thing. Preserve our infrastructure, raise the mill money now if you have to, and keep our schools open. Let the taxpayer backlash, especially the business backlash, which would be enormous, be our voice and your voice in Topeka. This is following the governor's plan. He said raise property taxes. If you want response from Topeka, you have to first get their attention, and I guarantee you that the business community of Wichita has lobbyists and a permanent presence in Topeka that get their <coughs> attention a heck of a lot better than a few of us parents who can make only maybe three or four trips in a, in a year to try to talk to them. Let's just save our resources. Our next speaker, speaker is Richard Stevenson. I am neither a parent of a student or a graduate of one of the schools under discussion. It may seem that I have no stake in this, but this is not true. I am here as a member of the proletariat class. This is relevant because the school closings are an example of class warfare, the rich against the poor. You come to say, we haven't the money to run these schools. I say, oh, there is money to be had. What we have here is a difference in priority. Three possible sources to balance these budgets, executive pay, the schools being built, and business. The executives are clearly overpaid if we're facing economic problems. New schools need rebuilding if the ones we have can't run, and business has money which we can tax to fund our schools. The reason these options aren't considered is because of class. What is important to bourgeois interests is to run as many people through a socialization mill for the lowest cost so that people are appropriately prepared to consume and produce. 
What is important to me, however, is that students are turned into critical and moral citizens. Closing the schools will have the effect of the former goals in mind rather than the latter. Seeing as the school closings will only aid bourgeois interests, coupled with the fact that we could keep the schools open, I am left with concluding that closing these schools is an act of class warfare. As a soldier in that war, I implore you to keep the schools open. I have offered three possible solutions for balancing the budget, and I'm sure there are more. Or, if you decide to close the schools, at least recognize that you are participating in a class war of the rich against the poor, and recall the time-honored maxim of self-defense. Thank you. I need your assistance back there because there obviously are people that are not taking these instructions seriously. They were asked to be quiet. They were asked not to show waving or I'm waving that. Now I am asking security to wow. please step up. If they now continue can't to wait. do so, I am asking you to escort them from the road. We can't do this. That's correct. No waving. Sign language. Sign language. Our next speaker is Mary Green. Stop, stop.